It's easy to be thankful after that, right? And for me, I'm doubly thankful because now that we're at this point in the liturgy, my work is basically done. All you'll hear me do is unpack the things that have already been said. I'll repeat most of them. That'll take up most of my time here. And I'll just add a couple of things here and there, okay? So if you'll indulge me, we can walk through it all again. Psalm 85 opens with the memory of a time when God had restored the people. The psalmist sings this, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath and you turned from your hot anger. Now this memory is arising in a time of trouble as a prayer for a new restoration. When the Hebrew Bible was given its form, people were, were reflecting on God's relationship with them and interpreting things like Israel's captivity and exile and Babylon as signs of God's judgment against them, against their disobedience, their unrighteousness. And so in many translations, when we get down to the, the psalmist's vision of God's intervention, it is this. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. In roughly the same period, those living under duress, including other psalmists at times, call not only for peace and righteousness, but also justice. In this word, we often translate as righteousness, as we do here in Psalm 85. It's in Hebrew, tzedek. It's translated as justice over in Psalm 37, where David sings this, Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Their ma the mouths of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongues speak justice. The law of, the, of their God is in their hearts, and their steps do not slip. The psalmists know God will speak peace into the lives of those who are seeking God's voice and listening for that word to come. And when that day comes and God's glory dwells in the land, peace and justice, peace and righteousness will embrace. They'll kiss. Now, let that wash over your mind for a minute, over your heart for a moment. I invite you to close your eyes, and especially if there's a sector of your life or if this is a season in your life characterized by chaos or being wronged or broken relationship or difficulty of some other kind, picture as clearly as you can what peace would look like for you. What does that mean to you right now? Now hold on to the feeling of peace there. How we get there is a big question. And it's our big ask of God as we go before God in prayer that we as a community would experience this peace. I might guess that not everyone here can imagine how it would happen that peace and justice would embrace or kiss. It's actually not that easy to imagine, is it, from the world that we see around us, from the the, the ways that our mind is sucked into other, other ways of thinking and other visions of a possible future. And even the psalmists themselves, as we've kind of heard, have slightly different angles on what they think should or will happen. The sons of Korah, for instance, who, from whom Psalm 85 comes, their father, Korah, was a cousin of Moses, as we heard, who was put to death for his role in an uprising against Moses. And these sons, seeing what happens when somebody acts in this way to vindicate their version of justice, right? They offer a vision of righteousness and peace, justice and peace kissing, leaving a lot of room for God to do the work, right? To flesh out what that vision looks like. It doesn't sound the same as David, for instance, sometimes, who calls down very specific fire on very specific enemies, right? He knows who the enemies are and how he wants them dealt with and directs God in that way. But the sons of Korah give us a different picture. 
One way of understanding the relationship between peace and righteousness in God's kingdom is through Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. So you may remember a time or two when Jesus says something like, you've heard it said, but I tell you, right? And this is one of those cases. Here's the case of anger that we take up. He says, you've heard it said, you've heard it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Now that adds a different something here, right? He's unpacking it, and often the way that we see this interpreted then is like this. Jesus takes the traditional teaching, don't, don't kill, and raises the stakes or gives us a loftier ideal to work for, right? But this isn't the whole story. Jesus is showing us something more here, and we might miss it if this is kind of all we're looking for. So, <clears throat> my late mentor, Glenn Stassen, argued that Jesus' teachings actually take on a pattern that's a little bit different from the one that we see here. And this is, this is really important to notice in this particular kind of teaching, the, so you've heard it said, but I tell you. And he says it's like this. When you hear the traditional teaching spoken, this is pretty clearly something from the law, right? We know that one of the t big ten is you do, do not kill. On top of that, the thing that happens is if all you say is don't kill, then there's a whole lot of room to do all sorts of other things in your heart against somebody who's made you angry, right? In this case, you harbor anger, it starts to fester, and you belittle them. Even if you don't bring the words to being spoken, inside your heart you can do a lot of damage. Your soul can wither away as you harbor anger against your brother or sister. And so what Glenn says is there's actually a threefold pattern here. And here in this third step, we're actually given a way out of the vicious cycle that anger draws us into. So when he goes on in Matthew 5, this is what Jesus says. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, and you remember that somebody has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled. Here, <clears throat> Jesus is showing us what it takes. He's giving us something that we can do, right, to get out of, to break the vicious cycle of anger in our own lives. So you can imagine ourselves swirling in this middle vicious cycle sort of way of living, and this is how he saw many people in his audience that day, and Jesus then breaks into the center and shows us the way out. But we still don't have the full story here. When Jesus offers us a transforming initiative in this specific case, the way he phrases it is very important and so subtle that we might miss the shift in attitudes. He says, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. Here Jesus has shifted the focus, redefining enemy for all those who have ears to hear what he says. Anger and indignation leads us to think about others and talk bad about them and harbor things against them, right? Gives us a certain eye for seeing them, but he says if someone has something against you, take the surprising initiative and go make peace. Do this before you try to offer your gift at the altar. It takes priority over anything like that. Now, it's relatively easy to see the peace here, but what about the justice? If someone has something against me and I go make peace? I think this makes a little more sense. I mean, it never really makes sense, but if we consider how Jesus is God's living, breathing, transforming initiative in our own lives, our passage today from Colossians also puts before us a memory of sorts, right? Paul says, while you were dead in trespasses, God made you alive together with him in Christ. While we were dead, or as Paul says back in chapter 1 of Colossians, while we were estranged, enemies in our way of thinking, God reconciled us to himself and Jesus and made peace between us. While we were enemies, God made the move of forgiveness. In Jesus, justice and peace embrace. And it doesn't happen exactly the way we think it might should if we know the law well. The great mystery here, Paul tells us, is how Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, take shape 
in us, his body today. How the peace of Christ in and through us as the body of Christ undoes the logic of the law by which our souls are held in captivity and drawn farther into this vicious cycle. Even as we think we're serving God. The idea that wisdom and knowledge are hidden in the person of Jesus clearly runs throughout the gospel stories about him. And it's part of what so often frustrates the teachers of the law around him. They are tasked with being the people who know all the things, the things of God, right? What makes a person righteous in God's sight? And why Israel hasn't been restored to its former glory? They know who God's friends are. They know who God's enemies are because they know what God wants from them, down to the detail. But then this man Jesus shows up, right? Mucks up the whole picture. He puts the squeeze on their views of God. Now, before we get too indignant about those folks, we might want to ask whether there are ways that we Christians, some 2,000 years later, find ourselves in the place of the teachers then. It's good, at times, to imagine ourselves serving others in the fashion of Jesus. What would Jesus do, right? But sometimes we might try imagining ourselves in other parts of these stories to see what Jesus might say to us if we happen to be in their shoes. For instance, even Paul heard the word of Jesus as against him before it was ever for him, while he was out persecuting Christians, doing what he thought God would have him do to his enemies, those who would distract from the mission of God in this world. Now, less common is it that we actively and intentionally set ourselves against God's kingdom. We all want it to come as we'll pray in a few minutes in the Lord's Prayer, right? On earth as it is in heaven. But we do tend to think that we know what God's kingdom and its enemies look like. And we may start to set our minds against those, even brothers and sisters, who seem to cut against it. And here we get back to the first transforming initiative, the one that's on the screen that we're talking about. The redefinition of enemies and the sense of how understanding is hidden away in Jesus. On one level, The vicious cycle is how it is that we apply our own traditional teachings that God will do justice on the basis of our definitions of justice, our own categorization of enemies. We read the Bible as on our side and we speak ill of those who don't read it as well as we do, condemn them for their views when they are different from ours. I should say this message is for me. My PhD is in Christian ethics. And my late mentor, his wife, used to say, what that means is you learn how to justify what you wanted to do already. And it feels like that sometimes, if you get into a certain mindset, that what I'm trying to do is prove to everybody else why I know what God wants them to do. We're not enemies from God's perspective, right? We are friends, and others are to us never enemies, except inasmuch as they may wish us ill. This is the word from Jesus today. Enemies are to us neighbors, object of our prayer and action toward peace. Now, Paul's more expansive message to the Colossians has to do with not being drawn away from this personal nature of the gospel. Jesus puts an end to judgment on the externalities of the law, right? So that life may happen within the soul who knows the living God. We're always at risk, however, for being drawn by human philosophies and teaching, right, into vicious cycles that close us off from God's kingdom transforming work. This is not least the case when we think justice or righteousness are at stake. When we think that we have a handle on the right thing and the right judgment, it's difficult to give space to those who disagree, who dissent from our opinions, who in our view flout the standard of righteousness or justice. And not only that, it is almost impossible to access the peace of the kingdom when we are so restless to make others do justice and righteousness just as we would have it happen. In other words, so much of the gap between peace and justice comes down to control. And this is what Paul is calling attention to when he speaks of the elemental spirits of the world. They seek for control. They drive for power. While our minds were elsewhere, however, set on these things. While we were trying to organize the world and others' thoughts and our own lives according to our ways of thinking, to what we feel is the tradition of all traditions, God entered into the world in human form in the life of Jesus to free us from the vicious cycles that entrap our souls. Peace and justice embrace deep in God's kingdom and in us 
in the body of Christ when we live into that reality with God. So, the church over time has been described as the body of Christ existing today, right? It's a metaphor that goes all the way back to Scripture in the New Testament, but it's even more than a metaphor. One of the ways that we hear the voice coming to us is through that body. The bodies we know, they have voices to lift and ears to hear, right? And this body isn't so very different from that. And even still, it's easy to get wrapped up in our own thinking. One of my theological lights, a person that I studied quite a bit, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who spoke against the Hitler regime and ultimately lost his life for his resistance. When he was speaking of confession in the community that he gathered together around him in those dark days, he writes that because human reality is so fundamentally relational, including the essence of our relationship with God, individual Christians really need to hear the voice of others on God's behalf, telling them that they're forgiven. We can convince ourselves of so many things. We can let ourselves off the hook and wonder if it's real. We can convince ourselves that we could never be forgiven for what we have done. But to hear another person say, in a voice we cannot deny, you are forgiven, does something else. And so here, today, I want to try another ancient Christian practice with a similar goal in mind. We're going to try passing the peace. The idea here is to remind one another and to hear from each other that God has made peace with us, that we are not dealt with as enemies, but as children, as siblings, as friends. And as we practice this with each other without any debates, without digging too deeply into each other's opinions about this or that issue that we might want to disagree on, right, based on our views of justice and righteousness, as we do this practice, we establish a baseline of peace among siblings. Those who regularly bid each other peace with their voices and with their hands in this way are going to be much less likely to take up against each other with those same instruments when the time comes, when push comes to shove, so to speak, In Matthew 5, remember, Jesus blesses the peacemakers, and as we've said, peacemaking is right in the middle of our calling as Christians. After his resurrection, Jesus shows up, and the first thing he says to his disciples is, peace be with you. And Paul, too, opens many of his letters this way, right? Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we practice the passing of peace today, we we not only receive a deep truth about our identities, We are ones with whom God has made peace, but we also practice it. We practice making peace with one another. So, here's what I'd like to to do. We'll stand and greet one another with these words. The first person says, the peace of the Lord be with you. And the second returns the blessing and says, and also with you. But as you do it, really receive the words. Look each other in the eye and find the peace that is there in the heart before you, the very heart of God. Stand and let's pass the peace. Peace be with you. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you all. This is how it's done. This is the start of a community at peace with each other. As we gather together, we gather in a common place, elbow and elbow, and remember that this is the body of Christ. These are our siblings, brother and sister all in Christ. And now I'll close us in prayer and we will move into our time of offering. Dear God, in the words of today's hymn, Shine your all-victorious love abroad in our hearts that our feet may no longer rove, rather be rooted and remain in you. Our Heavenly Father, and gift, giver of all good gifts, we ask you this morning to bless the, the tithes and offerings which we are giving now in humble gratitude. You have listened to us when we've prayed, and often we have been far more ready to ask than to listen for your answer. You know every need and want. Loving God, give us only that which will lead us to those choices that bring lasting joy and initiatives for abiding peace. Help us to fill every breath with gratitude. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.